welcome to another episode of Let's Talk About Mental Health. I'm Nels Kloster. I'm an addiction psychiatrist working in Southern Vermont. And I'm Robert Stack. I'm a licensed alcohol and drug counselor and licensed mental health counselor. Good evening. And as a reminder to our viewers, uh, we can be contacted with questions or comments through a Facebook site, uh, www.facebook.com forward slash Let's Talk VT, or by uh, text or email at uh, questions at Let's Talk VT.com. And, and also for the future, uh, we're developing a website for, yep. the, for the program where folks will be able to uh, hopefully download or view uh, v episodes of various uh, topics or uh, interest. And we'll keep you posted on, on that development. And currently, they can still get all of our uh, shows um, on BCTV if they go to that site. So that's also yeah. available. And I, I guess we should, we should also mention that uh, this just happens to be our 100th episode tonight. Right. That's right. That's yeah. right. Pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. I'm surprised uh, asses back for the tenth, much that, less the hundred. Right. And, and we owe it all to BCTV and the people who have been helping us. And uh, this is all volunteer, and it's just been great. It's, it's been wonderful. Yeah. Now we're we're just the, the, the tip of the iceberg, That's being right. seen in front of the camera, yeah. behind a lot of her dedicated and and uh, talented. And our volunteers. hope has always been to just help one person, and, and but in a bigger sense was to. You know, maybe we can help destigmatize some of this uh, mental illness and uh, also normalization and, and, and try and help people become more informed. And we've been very active with the, talking about the opiate problem. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been talking about it for a couple of years now, easily. Talked a little bit about the issue around marijuana uh, and, and, you know, alcoholism, family concerns, and we've had doctors on. So, it's really been pretty good, uh, I yeah. feel. It's really going into current yeah, I events. Think, I think as we were talking uh, before the show, you know, one of the uh, unfortunate aspects uh, of our work is that we know too many people who die prematurely. Right, and that brings me to something. We, locally, we had uh, someone recently die, um, and normally this is the kind of thing you say for the end of the show, and you say, oh, by the way, and. But I don't want to do that. I wanted to make sure I did it at the beginning of the show because I don't want to rush it and I don't want to try and squeeze it in when I get the notice that there's one minute left. And so I'm just going to read the first paragraph, first sentence, if you will, of an obituary that was in our local paper. And um, I'll just read it. Jeremiah Crompton, son of Joseph and Carol Moody Crompton of Brattleboro, ended his own life early Sunday morning. His death followed years of frustration, sorrow, rage, fear, boredom, delusion, and pain interspersed with times of brilliance and amazing humor. Uh, that It goes on from there and it talks more about his childhood and then it goes on and talks about the family members and his personal struggles. And so I don't really want to talk specifically about Jeremiah, but I did want to say that in my work in the hospital, I always tried to share with patients that, you know, when you're struggling with recovery, um, what a lot of people don't appreciate is just the struggle it is to get well. And it's really, it, it, from the, I don't think people understand or appreciate from the outside when they look at behavior or they see certain aspects of what's going on. Uh, they, even if they don't see it as willful behavior, they still, it's terribly judgmental but they almost have no understanding what it's like for the person who's involved with it. And this is something for some they've been struggling with since they were teenagers. Um, and it's very hard, they're on medication or off medication. Um, it's, it's not an easy thing. And I, 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 I don't judge anybody who commits suicide, and I'm not gonna talk about that per se, but I'm just gonna say that, you know, for some people, it, it's, it is such a struggle to try and get well and trying to make it work. Um, your medicines, it's not great being on some of the medicines. They don't feel right, they don't feel good. It's not great being off your medicine. You're, you know, the, you have other symptoms coming on, intruding and in, in thoughts. Um, it's very, it's, I, that's all I want to say is that, you know, whatever judgment you can make about what happened and why he did it, and, you know, one of the issues around grief sometimes is look for blame or fault. But I just want to say that this was this was beautiful. That yeah. that the family took the chance to say, this is what happened, yeah. and, and and to acknowledge it that there was pain and there was brilliance, 
and there was struggles and there was delusions and, and this was and, and and quite frankly and I I know people are going to misunderstand me when I say this, but it is noteworthy. It is worth being honest about it, telling the truth about what the struggle is. You know, if somebody died unexpectedly, that's fine. Say it. they died unexpectedly, but you know when someone struggles their whole life with mental illness and maybe heroin addiction. Uh, alcoholism, you know, just say it, you know, I mean, be honest about it and say this was their life and they struggled with this and this was, uh, and, you know, let's not be ashamed of it. Let's not be stigmatized by the illness. Even in death, it, it, it sort of continues. And yeah, anyway. I, was, I was very impressed with, with this obituary yeah. because there was a real, you know, honesty and, and yeah. forthrightness to it, so, you know, telling, telling it like it is. And we're seeing more of that these days, but I think by the fact that it's always been sort of, you know, um, you know, euphemized. People use certain expressions, yeah. uh, you know, died unexpectedly or, you know, not really naming it. Just like we see with, you know, mental illness in general and addiction, it's really a sign of the stigma around this, that right. people are not willing to talk about this. And being able to name this in an obituary, we see this here in Brattleboro. We're seeing this across the country in uh, parents writing obituaries for their children who've died of overdoses. As uh, people are saying, you know, there shouldn't be a shame in this. It shouldn't be hidden. Right. And uh, you know, one of the pieces too is we used to there used to be a shame with cancer that there isn't anymore right. as people became more aware of that, and we would always see uh, in obituaries you know fought this fight against cancer, and I think it's only right that now we're, we're able to see ourselves talking about fighting against mental illness, fighting against depression, right. fighting against uh, depression or schizophrenia. And this is a small community. Uh, we're, you know, we're not a big town and everybody knows everybody and, you know, we all know the people that we see on the street and, you know, interact with. And I think something like this allows people to talk about this topic. Mm -hmm. It allows them, and, and no family there's no family that should judge any other family. I mean, you know, there is no family that has escaped mental illness or addiction or alcoholism. I mean, if there are, I'd, well, I'd love to meet them. I mean, you know, that we can do a study with them or something. But by and large, I mean, these are things that are almost universal in our society to different degrees, obviously. But it really has opened up for people to say in all walks of life, oh, I knew him as a kid, or I knew him in this setting or that setting, um, and, and be able to talk about this issue. And so I, I want to say thank you to the family. I hope they appreciate that we did this, and we did this with all due respect, and we did this with, um, I don't know if the word is to honor, but to acknowledge his life and to acknowledge his struggle. I. I uh, and you'll forgive me for this, but I, I mean, you know, there's that saying that they that they use, and uh, and and sometimes you'll hear it. You know, may you rest in peace. And I feel that way about Jeremiah. May he rest in peace, whatever that means. I mean, uh, may he be at peace with himself. And, and I and I mean that. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll just say one other thing because I want to quote the article because th these are folks, and they said, let Jeremiah's life remind us that the safety net for those who suffer from mental illness, especially those with a dual diagnosis, needs substantial weaving and mending. And so again, you know, the idea that we do do in our society, we reach out for people, we do what we can, we offer services, we have hospitals, we have clinics, we have medications, we have a lot of different things, but you know, they're sort of, they don't always fit every individual. Uh, we, were, we were talking yeah. about that. I mean, I mean to, to name what's going on, like uh, the, the diagnoses we have in the, in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, oftentimes we're sort of you know, using terms like not otherwise specified or atypical, yeah. Yeah. for example. So really, we're, we're missing a language to really adequately describe what a lot of people are, are struggling with. Right, and so when we make these things, and then thank you for using it. I mean, that's a great, you know, atypical, you know, I mean, I understand what they mean, that there's a typical mentally ill patient or whatever, you know, they have a, a group of symptoms, if you will. But I think we all are atypical. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I mean, we're all unique. And this especially becomes true with, with a, when you see people struggle with alcoholism or heroin addiction at the same time, struggling with different mental aspects. I mean, their life is unique. The, the, people should not mistake that. Uh, all of our lives are unique, but this is, uh, 
uh, th this is a different journey. And uh, I, I used to tell my patients in the hospital that they were on a, a heroic journey. Mm -hmm. And I meant that. I mean, that, you know, you hear this sometimes in minorities or women who say, you know, we have to work extra hard just to make up for our status. Well, that is especially true with people with mental illness and addictions and alcoholism. They have to work extra hard to sort of find their way, to make their way in the world. And I don't think uh, most of us, if we go out of our way once in a while, it, it, we complain. Imagine going every day to sort of have a normal day. I mean, it's not a, you know, you, I hear one person complain about seeing people go in the clinic every day. And they think, well, every day I see them going to the clinic. and I, and. You know, well, what's wrong with that? I mean, that is a good thing. Every day they go to the clinic. I, I remember when I go to the hospital, get my blood work done. There's people in there every week getting their, you know, yeah. getting treatment for their illness. And it's a good thing to see people get on the bus and go to the clinic and see them going up to the clinic in our town. I mean, that, they don't see it that way, I, but it's a... Uh, they see it differently. And I, I would just like to say, listen, you wouldn't want that life. You wouldn't want a life of mental illness. You wouldn't want uh, a life of heroin addiction. I wouldn't wish it on anybody, uh, quite frankly. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, well, maybe that's just to sort of pr protect our own selves, to feel good about ourselves, yeah. because, you know, when you, as we've worked with so many people who struggle yeah. with these issues, they're, they're they're really very much like like all of us. You know, everybody yeah. wants the same thing. People want uh, uh, to to be loved, respected. Um, they want to have a sense of purpose, and it's even harder for people when they struggle with mental illnesses yeah. to have those very basic human needs. Yeah. And it's a shame if through uh, you know stigma and and judgment we make the hurdle even higher for them to obtain those very basic needs. Well. I want to thank you for all the work you do. I mean, I mean it. In your clinic and you work with uh, getting housing for people with mental illness, I mean, it makes a huge difference in their life and all that you do. So thank you. Um, well, thank you for your yeah, time, yeah, yeah, too. Yeah, never mind Just that. because you're later in your career doesn't mean you don't deserve some credit, too. Yeah. Um, another, uh, so we were reading something talking about well, actually, despair. Yeah. And I think this was it was this in the New York Times. Yeah. And a psychologist talking about how I think was it titled "Despair Good for You." Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Something uh, catchy like that. And then uh, we have this sort of uh, should we say just sort of the, the sense of things being negative and to be avoided, but also we don't have a very rich vocabulary, a right. very uh, nuanced way of looking at the broad array of emotions uh, that we experience, both on the it's negative and the positive side. Right, and it, what I was talking about was uh, that a lot of us use one word to describe something that it only really, truthfully, has meaning for ourselves. So if I tell you I'm depressed, you're like, yeah. okay, and then somebody else say, I have depression, it's in my yeah. family, or what, you know, and that's okay, yeah. I mean, I guess it's okay. But a lot of times, I remember I worked with a Dr. Mandel and, uh, mm -hmm. at the hospital, and uh, I, I can remember him saying, not just to me, but to other people, don't tell me the diagnosis, tell me the symptoms. I'll make the diagnosis. Right. And that, I think that a lot of us, I've, I've run into this, and you know I'm going to get back on my soapbox here. But no, but I, a lot of people self-diagnose themselves. And that's especially true with alcoholism. I sometimes hear people say, oh, I have depression. Uh, and, and I'm not sure to have depression. And one of the dangers with that is that they end up saying, I drink because I am depressed. Uh, you know, be, and that's why I'm drinking is because I'm depressed. I don't know if that's really true. I think they drink because they're alcoholics. Mm -hmm. and, and if you convince yourself that the reason you drink is because you're depressed, you end up telling yourself, well, my alcohol is my medicine for my, for my depression. And that's how you rationalize or justify your relapse, because I'm taking my medicine. And everybody knows that if you're an alcoholic, you shouldn't drink. That's why many people say, oh, I'm a problem drinker, I'm a heavy drinker, because that's sort of negotiable. Alcoholics don't drink. And if you're drinking and you're an alcoholic, you don't drink. And I, I think that's why the danger is, is when you say, well, the cause is something else. And one of the things that you and I were talking about it was almost the inarticulateness of you know not having the right words. I remember at the hospital, we used to give people a list of words of feelings, 
and we give them a timesheet and say, you know, tell us how you were feeling. Oh God, 20, 50 different words that's, describe all the right. array of feelings. And, and most people would look at it and they're, they're overwhelmed by it because they're yeah. so used to saying, uh, I'm angry. Yeah, I mean, most guys, I get two go to emotions, sure. right? I'm either angry or I'm happy. And then, what do you mean? I feel vulnerable? I feel anxious? Right. No, I'm, I'm angry, I'm happy. That's, or I'm in withdrawal or I'm high. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? It's sort of like, a, so when you say, are you, are you discouraged? And I should say, and we both can talk about this, um, the article goes on to say that when you use different words to describe what you're doing, then you can take different actions. Right. So if you said, I, I, I'm, I feel bad, yeah. but what does that mean? That you're a bad person? That you, you know what I mean? Like, what, how, what do you do about that if you're bad? What is yeah. it, you know, you're not bad. Um, if you can use a different term, and one of the things they were recommending, the example that they used in the article was Flint, Flint Michigan, right? Right, with the uh, contaminated water right. there. And the person said, you know, well, my water's no good. Um, yeah. I, I have no water or yeah. whatever. I mean, it was and a very dead end yeah. kind of yeah. thing. I, I feel sad. Yeah. And then what happens is you just get, you get stuck in that. More discouraged. Whereas if you, for example, um, Fell, I think the term is righteous indignation right. or, your, or anger, as well as you know being sort of upset at the injustice of it. Then you take a different course. Right. The bad, you kind of passive, you withdraw, you feel helpless. But the idea that you know I'm outraged by what has happened here, that sense would lead you then to possibly reach out to representatives, get involved with protests, you know, write letters, go places, that's and right. that's a much more productive thing. And uh, you know, whenever we develop an action plan, then we start to feel much better because uh, regardless of the result, taking, taking action against something helps us to feel better. And I got to say, this really is part of parenting. And part of parenting is modeling. So when you're talking about how you feel, and you're asking a child how they feel, or you're asking a teenager how they feel, and their feelings are very complex. They're very sort of, there's all kinds of feelings. I feel omnipresent, I feel very powerful, but I feel very vulnerable. You know what I mean? I, I, uh, I'm very egotistic, I'm very self-centered, but I'm very sort of feel inferior. I don't feel good about myself. So I mean, it's, it's almost like you have to teach people what, are, what exactly are you feeling? Or, or try and use other words to express what's going on. And then we can identify what you can do. And I know, you know, I've, I've often talked about this cognitive behavioral therapy, and I really feel like it, it's, it's underutilized. And I, one of the reasons I believe is that there's no pharmaceuticals involved, and therefore there's no advertisement for it. But cognitive behavioral therapy says take a look at the way you think about things. And the way you think about things, if you don't mind for a second, yeah. whatever you label what happens to you will dictate your response to it. So you know you have a core belief system, something occurs, and, and if you attach a meaning to it that is sort of negative and it's very limiting, like, then that is going to dictate how you react to it. And so it's so important to see, this has happened to me, and there's different ways I can think about this. There's different ways I can label what's happening. And, and I think that's just a matter of practice. I think it's just a matter of... Well, absolutely. And like they said, this is not, our, our feelings are not some sort of um, natural reaction of the brain to the environment. There's a lot, there's, there's training around, there's a socializing around this. And so we can learn how to, to do these things. Now, I mean, this is, this is kind of silly, but this morning uh, I'm driving to work. I'm supposed to be at the methadone clinic at uh, 6 o'clock. 5.30, I have a flat tire. And I'm thinking, it's Monday. I'm starting my week. I mean, the sun's barely up. Yeah. And I thought, this is just great. My, here goes my week. Here goes my day. I'm going to be late. Well, and I'm weaving this path that's going to ruin my whole week all the way to Friday. Right. And then I started thinking, well, yeah, dude, you know how to change a tire. Yeah. You're going to get on there. <laughs> okay, I'm going to be... 25 yeah. minutes late yeah. for this thing. That's and then right. I was like, boy, aren't you silly catastrophized just because it's Monday morning and all that sort of, uh, that, that meaning that comes about, yeah. uh, you know, Mondays are awful, yeah. starting the week, this yeah. and that, that just, you know, almost took me away. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I'm, I, it's funny you use that example because I'm terrible about people being late. I mean, if I'm in a meeting and you're late consistently, you've moved yeah. on to my enemy list. Right. You know right. what I mean? It's like, but every once in a while, 
I'm late. <laughs> <laughs> and so I now think that once in a while, my life is, that I'm late for something just to teach me tolerance. There you go. You know, because I have a double standard. You know, when I'm late, well, you know, that's how things go, you know? I mean, you know, this is how it is. And, you know, and I have this sort of, uh, 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 you know, I forgive myself fairly rapidly, yeah. fairly quickly, you know. But if somebody else is late, you know, and, and I have to remind myself when I, when I see that, that maybe there's a reason they're 10 minutes late. I mean, you're sitting here judgmental, and you have no idea what they go through to get where they are, you know, or yeah. what's going on in their life. And so I think that's a perfect example. I mean, yeah. sometimes you get this... Uh, you, you, you decide on what you see and what you see, what you interpret will dictate how you feel. And like you were saying, you were already looking at the whole week as ruined. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, starting off with a flat tire, you yeah. know, as if you don't just, know how to change yeah, it. It's just yeah, great, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I think in a way, I mean, it, you know, some of these things are... are it, it, it's good to remind yourself sometimes. Yeah. I mean, because I bet in your business, occasionally you have somebody late for an appointment. Occasionally. Okay. <laughs> occasionally. And, and being a doctor, you can imagine I'm only occasionally running late myself. That's right. So you, again, we need a little more, maybe a little more creativity around this, <laughs> that uh, it's not because somebody dislikes me, is disrespecting me. That's right. There's this whole other nuance, but if something happened at home, something happened on the way, something else is on the mind, that sort of opens up things. Yeah. And I think, as they were talking about, sort of what they, they called this emotional granularity, right? The idea that you could name many more sort of states of feeling rather than just angry, bad, you know, sad, that sort of thing. And it, I, I, and I think that's one of the yeah. issues I think we both have around the, uh, the, the, the language, the sort of psych speak that we see through the diagnostic statistical manual and the way people say, you know, I have depression, I am bipolar, I mean, it's not, is this really just narrowed down the range of language and then which also narrows down the range of possibilities what you can do around this situation to take responsibility to advocate for yourself and to work towards your own wellness. And, and the other thing is that often when I, I sometimes worry because I've, I've worked with patients that struggle with this, they begin to believe that their symptoms of their illness is who they are. Right. In other words, they don't recognize that the symptom of their illness, what they're experiencing, is just part of their illness. It's not them. And I think, I think we all sort of miss that sometimes because it's hard to understand, like, well, am I not what I do? Well, I guess, maybe. Well, this is what I do, therefore that's who I am. I'm not so sure about that. I mean, I, I think sometimes, especially when you're dealing with mental illness or when you're dealing with addiction, uh, you will see behaviors and you will see things that are indicative of other major problems. But often they're just a symptom or a piece. And they're not even permanent. They're temporary. But they're not who you are. Yeah. And I think that even parents and outsiders and teachers sometimes will interpret a certain behavior, make a judgment about that behavior, and assume that that judgment is who the person is. And, and I, I, you know, until you don't really know. I mean, I, I got to just say that. I mean, you really don't know the negotiation for some people, like a person who's always late. Uh, are they overcoming some sort of phobia or fear? Uh, and their fear of talking to people or being, you know, so they come late so they can sit by the door or they can avoid, they have some social phobia and they're sort of, you know, really struggling with like people talking to them or, or being seen or being noticed or they're afraid if they come, somebody will find out something. You know, I mean, yeah, and you don't understand that. You can assume they're lazy. You can assume they're disrespectful. You can make all kinds of wrong assumptions. And then not only that, identify that person by that assumption that that's who they are when the truth of the matter is that is not who they are uh, and they're, 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 we are all so much more than our symptoms I mean I you know when I think of Jeremiah I mean you could have seen him on the street and made a decision about who he was you could have run into him in different settings and made a decision about who he was and it's not who he was I mean what what you were seeing was a symptom of something else and that is not the person. 
Yeah, and, you, and you, you talked earlier in the show about the, uh, the heroic journey. Yeah. Again, and I was thinking about that again when you talked about how some people think that what they do is who they are. Yeah. And really, no, that's, uh, I mean, for many people, what they do might be the process through which they take the hero's journey to then sort of develop and become who they're going to become. And it's just that piece, symptoms are, and, and even, I mean, diagnoses are often not what's wrong with you, but almost a description of what happened to you might be a more accurate way of looking at that. Right. And then how do we then as human beings respond to the things? How do we change and develop based on the things that happened to us? And what I would do in therapy, or, or not therapy, I'm not, I'm not a great therapist, but you know what I would do when I was doing counseling and stuff is just this idea, like a lot of people will say, I, I, that's not what I intended to be was such and such a person. What I want to be is such and such a person. But my behavior is not that. And, and I'm not trying to get into double talk. You know, you get to that point where you say, well, I'm actually a good person. I really don't mean to hurt anybody. But when I look at my life, I've hurt everybody. I've hurt most of my family members. I've hurt people that, that care about me. But that's the process of recovery is the identification, the discovery, if you will, that there is this split between what you want to be and who you've become. And part of getting better is bringing those closer together. Right. You know what I mean? And so even then, you, it's, it's, you know, people will say, look, what's, look at who I am. You know, look what I've become. Well, that doesn't mean you can't change. I mean, that's why yeah. people get well. Right, and we develop that our entire life. And I mean, I, I, I'm often, when I'm talking to people, I'm, I'm putting my hands like saying, look, th this is part of the tension right now, is that you have these expectations of who you were going to be, and then where you find yourself, and if there's a large distance between these two, you can't be happy. So somehow these things have to move, either changing the expectations or changing the situation that you're in, that you need to take some kind of action. Uh, to do that. I, mean, I don't think any of us, especially now as we approach our age, are exactly where we expected to be or who we expected to be. That's right. And, and I've really, it's been such a growth for me, I, you know, working in a hospital for 28 years or so and meeting people who are struggling with ad, uh, addiction, and alcoholism, mental illness, um, getting to know people through my job and volunteering at, at uh, different places and getting to know. And you really you find out that, you know, making assumptions based on face or on, on clothing or whatever, it's just not valid. It's just not even useful at all. I mean, quite frankly, it's a, it's a fool's earned. I mean, until you know the person, until you know what it is for them every day in their life to, to, to go through their day, to go through uh, what some people have gone through before you make a judgment, before you decide to label that person uh, minor behavior. Yeah. Uh, I think that's something we all have to be careful about. I think one of the things that we have to do in, in our work that it might suggest to other people too is uh, finding some way to like the person that you're encountering. Yeah. Looking for something positive in there and, and once you recognize what we have in common and find those likable traits then, then you find yourself pulled in and start to shed some of your prejudices. And then my, you know, there's, there's tolerance in that but there's also growth in that as well. Yeah, and we all just see what we see. Now, we had other things we were going to talk about tonight. Uh, we may have to do this show again. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 101st episode. 101st yeah. episode. No, there was a, yeah. a couple of different interesting things that maybe we'll come back and address in, in a future show that we on our agenda. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. I think that, uh, you know, regardless of um, these things we're talking about, it all boils down very much to... We all have the same needs. Right. Now, um, one of the things that I wanted to mention and is that, um, well, th we would like more people to reach out to us and, make, and uh, let us know that they see us, uh, send questions in, send comments in. Uh, we can't really promise that we can respond to everybody, but we can at least incorporate people's concerns. Uh, with the show so that we can talk about that. Um, I, I just wanted to make that point. Yeah, this might be a local show, but there's some very common yeah. themes to what we experience here. Thank you all. Yeah, good night.